All right, hello Chemistry 111 guys in quarantine. I'm so sorry things have taken you out of the game and you had to miss lab. We really miss having you in lab and um, in order to kind of do our best to support you, we're throwing together this video to do our best to give you a good virtual experience. I know it can't be exactly the same, but we're doing our best. So hang in there and, and stay safe and, and we'll try to get you through this. Okay, so Hopefully you read the Chemistry 111 lab, the Beer's Law lab for this week, because it's really important. It's got a lot of information you need, a lot of background. So if you haven't, you probably want to hit pause and, and go read that. So make sure you've done that. I'll wait for you. Okay, now that you've read it and you're back, you know, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So the idea here is that I'm going to go through basically a little bit of a discussion on um, light absorption for molecules and, and how, you know, things are uh, appear various colors to us and so let's go ahead and dive right in this is also the thing you're gonna to have to write a summary paragraph of so make sure you take some notes and if you need to rewind go ahead and rewind I'll try to keep it short uh, I don't want to be too boring but there's some material here that I don't know if we covered very much in class but um, it was a really important part of the lab so okay what we're gonna do is we're gonna say okay uh, the demo discussion part uh, at the beginning of the lab that you had to miss it basically had you had a essentially a beaker and this beaker had a solution in it and the solution was uh, essentially red in color kinda like the sports drink that we're gonna analyze so you had a red solution and what we did was is we had a, le a red um, laser pointer you know what a laser pointer is right so you've probably played with those or used them so here's our laser pointer and it's got a hole here and this one uh, shoots out red light so it's got a beam we're gonna shoot the red beam through and the prediction was does the red laser pointer go through the red solution or does it get absorbed by the red solution and take a moment and I want you to make a guess and write it down somewhere in your lab notebook and and what do you think do you think the red laser pointer light is gonna go through and not be absorbed or do you think the red solution the dye molecules in the red solution are gonna absorb the red light well, it so happens that when we did this in lab, we found out that the red laser just went right on through. Basically was not impeded at all. Went right through the solution. Totally transmitted. Amazing. And then what we did is we took another laser pointer. And in this case, we had a green laser pointer. And we had green light. And we hit that solution with green light. Now in this case, do you think it's going to get absorbed or do you think it's going to go right through and be transmitted through? Well, in this case, guess what happened? We saw that the green laser pointer, as it started to go through the solution, it got weaker and weaker and weaker and that was because the red dye molecules that are in that solution were absorbing. They were interacting with the green light in a way they did not interact with the red. And that was really thought-provoking because we said, what's going on here? Why would a red solution allow red light to go through it, but a green solution gets absorbed? And it deals with the idea of the complementary colors and the idea of um, the way light interacts with molecules. And so I'm going to do my best in just a few minutes to kind of give you the idea of what's going on behind here. Well, in your lab, you probably read and you saw the, the structure of the red 40 molecule. The red 40 dye is put into a lot of food products here in the US. Um, you know, strawberry sodas, you know, um, all kinds of things. And they put it in there so you get these bright pretty colors. And I want to talk about why that, why, do, why does that dye make these uh, products that bright red color? Well, it, it kind of deals with the idea of electrons and molecules and so if you have a molecule it's got a structure and, and I'm not going to draw the whole structure but red 40 right the red 40 molecule has a really complex structure and remember there are electrons in that structure you know this because why well because molecules are made of atoms and they have lots of electrons well molecules just like atoms guess what they have many 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 levels that the electrons can be found in. So to make a really simple example, right, kind of like Bohr, although it doesn't really work that way in molecules, um, you, you have, you know, various energy levels. And the electrons occupy these energy levels, right, in the orbitals. 
And what can happen then, we can design molecules that have very specific energy levels and when a photon of light hits, so there's a photon, when a photon of light hits this molecule, it may have an energy that, guess what, matches the difference between one of these energy levels, right? That would be the delta E. This is in your lab handout. If it matches this gap exactly, it can energize this electron and it can jump. It can be promoted an energy level up or one or two, doesn't really matter. But essentially, if the wavelength of light or the energy of light matches that gap, the molecule can absorb it very, very effectively. However, if the photon does not have the match, it goes right on through and does not interact. And so what we can say then, if we relate this back to our observation here, the red light did not have a matching energy. It did not interact with this molecule and went right on through. However, the green light, right, green light is higher in energy than red. It has a shorter wavelength. And that energy difference happened in this case to match the energy difference in some of the uh, energy levels of the dye molecule and that caused a promotion and so that promotion absorbed that photon of that green color. So that's really neat because that means that we can design dye molecules that have certain energy differences that will only absorb certain colors and allow the other colors to pass right on through. That's really important because what we can do now is we can say okay if you go into your dorm or your room or if you're in quarantine right now you can stare at the ceiling and you can see a, a, a lamp, right? And that lamp is probably a fluorescent light tube. I'm just gonna draw a light bulb. Okay, so we got a light bulb and it's gonna emit light. And I could ask you what color is that light bulb or what color is the room light that you have? You're probably gonna say like I would say, it's white light. Well, what does white light mean? Remember white light, if you go back to like, you know, kindergarten or whatever, wherever you learn this, it's Roy Jabiv, right? You've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, right? So white light is a combination of all those colors, right? It's the combination of Roy G. Biv. Really important. Okay, so what does this mean? It means then that this solution, right, this red solution is red because of what? Well, it's red because, guess what? We saw that it absorbed green, right? It absorbed green light. That was really the only wavelength that it gobbled up. And so what we can look at is we can kind of think of it like this, right? If we take our beaker or our test tube and I'll draw some red solution in there. If we shoot Roy Jibiv, right? If we shoot the whole white light combination of wavelengths through not all of them are going to be absorbed. In fact, most of them are not. Most of them are going to go right on through. And so what's going to go through, what's going to be transmitted through or reflected if you had a t-shirt or something, uh, Roy G. Biv, we know that green light was absorbed. So guess what? We now have the color wheel minus what was absorbed. And if we kind of cross out what was absorbed here, you'll notice now you have Roy G. Biv that reaches your eye after going through the solution. So what do you see? You see the color pi, right? Minus green, which means it's gonna be richer in the red area of the color wheel. And that's why we see the color red. It's because the green was absorbed and removed by the solution, right? So the green photons were absorbed by the dye molecule and the other, mo the other wavelengths were transmitted through and that's why we see red. So whenever you see something that's a color, it's always the color you see because the opposite or the complementary color, in this case, red's complement is green. Green was removed, green was absorbed, and what we see is the color wheel minus green, which is richer in red. That's really neat. So make sure uh, you take a moment to write this down and summarize this. So whenever you see a Wabash t-shirt, it's red because the molecules in the t-shirt are absorbing the green photons and what bounces off or reflected to your eyeball and processed by your brain is the whole white color wheel, right, minus the green, which is richer in red. It's complement. 
And so you can kind of, you know, think about the other way. What if you had a green shirt, right? If you had a green shirt, it's not going to absorb green photons because it's green. It actually absorbs the red photons. So green, things that you see like green grass, right? Green in the grass on the mall is green because it is absorbing the red area of the spectrum. And so you see the light that bounces off is richer in the complement, the opposite side of the color wheel, uh, which happens to be green. Really neat. Okay, now how can we use this to design an instrument? And the way we can do that is we can say, okay, we're going to have our sample. And in this case, I'm going to take a rectangular test tube. We call it a cuvette. And we use rectangular ones because circular test tubes and circular beakers can interfere with the optics of light. Um, we're going to go ahead and fill this up with our red solution. So we got some red solution in there. And we want to pick a wavelength that interacts with this molecule. So like we saw before, and in the lab handout, you see we want to pick the wavelength that is most interacting with these dye molecules. And I believe that's something like 510 nanometers. That's a cyan color, kind of a greenish color, right? And how can we generate that? Well, if we want to generate this color, there are a couple different things we could do. We could use a laser pointer. It's a little expensive but we can use a really nice what's called an LED, a light emitting diode. And you saw some of the um, electronic discussion in the building of the instrument, but what we really need here is a light source, right? That's the main thing. We need a light source. And it has to be a stable light source. We need a constant amount of light intensity. You can't have it fluctuating. You need a really stable source. And what we'll say is uh, the intensity, right? The intensity of that light, I'm gonna say the initial intensity, I initial, is what comes out of that light, the LED, right? We can wire this up to a battery or a power pack and it's gonna give us lots of green photons. And we know from the prior um, discussion that green photons are selectively absorbed by the red molecules in this dye, in the commercial beverage we're gonna analyze. So what's gonna happen then is let's say we have a whole bunch of photons I would argue not very many are gonna get through in fact most of them are gonna be absorbed by the red light so we will have a final a final intensity and how will we measure the photons well we we'll have to generate a detector and this guy will be a detector and it basically detects incoming photons that strike its surface using, guess what? It generates a voltage due to the photoelectric effect, right? The photons can hit the detector. If they have a certain amount of energy, they knock an electron loose and we can read a voltage. And in the lab, you would have actually hooked this up to a voltmeter and you would get, you know, some reading of like five volts or whatever. And that voltage will change based on the number of photons that get through the solution and hit the detector. So basically you have an initial intensity, which should not change. However, depending on a number of circumstances, such as how concentrated the dye is and some other things we're gonna talk about, how many molecules are in here, we get a final which is lower than the initial. And we can find a ratio, right? We can take the final intensity over the initial intensity times 100, and we get what? We get a percent T, percent transmittance. How many photons, what percent of the photons made it through the solution to hit the detector as opposed to the number you start out with. Really neat. That's really important. So percent T, percent transmittance, really, really important. Now, what are some factors that come into play here? Well, number of things, right? Well, first of all, we're gonna really focus right now on the concentration, right? If you think about it, the more molecules of dye that you put in here, guess what? the more green photons are going to get gobbled up and absorbed. So the less are going to make it to the detector. So as concentration goes up, I final goes down, which means your percent transmittance goes down. So the less concentrated, the more photons get through. And that's really important to think about. So if you're going to build this instrument, you might want to set some boundaries. Well, what we could do, right? If we have 100% to work with, 
you can probably say, what would be your lower limit? Well, the lowest limit would be what? 0%. Well, how could you make sure 0% of the photons get through here? Well, what you could do, right, is you could put something in the beam path, the light path, right, instead of a solution, you could put something that's totally dark. And in the lab, what we did was we took one of these cuvettes and we filled it with black clay. It's going to totally absorb. And that's really important. So if it totally absorbs, 0% of those photons are going to get through. Because if you have that green light, right, that green light's going to hit, it's going to hit, it's going to hit, and nothing is going to come out. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So that sets a lower limit. But what about the higher limit? The highest limit you have, right, the highest limit, what would that be? Well, that would be 100%. That would mean that what that would mean that essentially <laughs> every single photon right every single photon that hits that cuvette would have to come through and hit your detector that would mean that initial intensity has to equal final intensity to get a hundred percent so what you'd like to do is you'd like to remove anything right anything and everything that would absorb green light so you would have no red dye and what is the red dye dissolved in? Water, right? So you would only fill this cuvette, only fill it with H2O, which as you know, water is colorless. It does not absorb any photons of visible light. So now you have essentially your lower limit, which would be zero. You have your upper limit, which would be 100. And so now what you can begin to do is introduce cuvettes that have known concentrations right and what you can generate is a graph of percent T versus concentration and remember if we have zero concentration that's only DI water our value up here will be a hundred percent right and so that would be a one point that you could think about. And then what's going to happen is you could increase the concentration. And remember, as you increase the concentration, what's going to happen? You're going to add more dye. If you add more dye, that's going to absorb more photons. If more photons are absorbed, IF goes down and your percent T goes down as concentration goes up. And it would look something kind of like like this and here's the deal it's gonna have this shape here this is actually an exponential plot exponential plots are kinda of difficult to deal with because I don't know maybe you're better at math than I am I don't think in exponential functions I would rather have a linear function and that's where our last uh, point of information comes into play where instead of dealing with percent T we're going to deal with not the amount of light that goes through, but we want to deal with the amount of light that gets absorbed. And absorbance is related to percent T by this very simple equation that's in your lab handout. Absorbance is equal to 2 minus log base 10 of the percent T. And if you think about it, 2 is basically the log of 100 because 100 is your upper limit. That's where that 2 comes from. So log of 100 is 2. So that's where that 2 comes from, minus the percent T. And that will give us absorbance. That's really useful. And that's because when you plot absorbance versus concentration, and you probably saw this in the pre-lab, well, if you have zero, if you have zero concentration, you have zero absorbance. And as you increase your concentration, the neat thing about absorbance, and this is amazing, absorbance is linear versus concentration and that allows you to get a beautiful equation of y equals mx plus b and if you think about it, the y-intercept should be zero so the b dies off and your equations y equals mx and if you think about it you can relate absorbance to concentration and that is really powerful absorbance is related to three things and it's as easy as a b c well, the first one, let's get out of the way, C is concentration. We talked about that. Typically, we will measure that in molarity. That's what we're really interested in this lab. 
what we're going to do in the first part of the lab is we're going to take known solutions of known concentration and we're going to measure the absorbance for known solutions and generate a plot and that will help us generate a linear regression line and then what we're going to do in the second part is we're going to take an unknown that we have no idea what the concentration is but we'll measure the absorbance and use the linear regression to calculate the concentration this is really really powerful these other two things are not quite as important but they at least in this example but they can be changed B is what's known as the path length path length and it's typically measured in centimeters. Now what is that? Well think about it. If we have a, a sample holder that has green dye, a red dye in it, excuse me, let's say we make that, that sample holder twice as wide. Well, if we made it twice as wide and we filled it up with red dye, guess what that means? That means that the light would have to go through twice as much red dye to escape. Well, that would definitely interfere with the amount of light that gets through. So the amount, the length of material you go through really does impact absorbance. Now today we're going to assume, in most days, we're going to assume that we keep our path length the same. And to make it rather easy, we keep it as one centimeter. So if you think about it, if it equals one, guess what? We don't really need to worry about it so much. The last one is A. A is a really kind of tricky one. It's called molar absorptivity and it's typically uh, this is our a I'm gonna let you think about the units because absorbance actually really doesn't have any units so if you know that B is in centimeters and you the molarity is in concentration for C I'm gonna let you figure out what the units for molar absorptivity should be molar absorptivity is a constant and essentially it's equal to um, how effective is a molecule at absorbing light of a certain wavelength. And this is really important. And so we're not gonna measure it today, but you can measure it because it ends up being the slope of your plot, which is really kinda cool. Um, so right now, just remember that this is known as Beer's Law, the title of the lab. It's actually the Beer-Lambert Law, but Beer came first, Beer-Lambert Law. And it tells you that absorbance is equal to the molar absorptivity times the path length times the concentration. And today all we're really gonna worry about mainly is the correlation of concentration with absorbance. And that will allow us to use a simple mathematical relationship to number one in part A, come up with a calibration or a standard plot like I drew here, where we're gonna generate some known concentrations and measure the absorbance and plot them and get a regression value, a linear regression. And then we can take an unknown, measure the absorbance, and use that linear regression equation to calculate concentration. This is very powerful. I hope this is helpful. Uh, at this point, you need to stop and write a little bit of a uh, paragraph to summarize what we talked about. And we'll move on when you're ready. So go ahead and pause and take a moment if you need to. All right, the next thing we're going to do, if I get my computer mouse to work, is we're going to uh, minimize Word here, and we're going to visit uh, the FET um, simulation uh, data bank. This is actually hosted by some amazing people at the University of Colorado of Boulder. Actually, this program was founded by a Nobel laureate focusing on FET actually stands for physics education technology but it's expanded now to chemistry and astronomy and all kinds of amazing things and there's going to be a link in the video description below so make sure you can click that link to access this and I'm going to walk you through what you need to do um, let me get my data out here and move it over here so you can't see it and I'll bring it back okay so I'm gonna open this by just clicking on it. And at first it looks kind of crazy, but let me show you what we got. Okay, what you wanna do is um, you've got your solution and we're gonna deal with drink mix because we the whole point of this was to determine uh, the amount of red 40 dye and this simulation uses drink mix, but whenever it says drink mix, please in your lab notebook write red 40 because that's what we're interested in. And you, know, you can actually pick a whole bunch of different things, but we're just gonna pick drink mix. So make sure you're picking this. And you'll notice it looks kind of like red in color, which is what our drink mix should look like. 
And the first thing we're going to do is kind of look at the layout here. We've got a detector on this side of the screen. It can measure transmittance or absorbance. I want us to leave it on transmittance for now. You've got a, a light source here, LED or whatever, and you can turn it on and turn it off by clicking the red button on the light source. So you can turn it on and turn it off like that. And notice when you turn it on, light hits the detector and it gives us a value. We are allowed to control the wavelength. I think this is really neat. So I'm going to I'm going to, I'd like you to not leave it at preset. I want to go to variable. So click on variable and look, I'll turn it on, but we can control the color of light that we use in our instrument. So that's really important. So we can use purple, uh, violet, blue, cyan, green, yellow, orange, red, all kinds of cool colors. And so what we're going to do right now is we want to pick a color that is highly absorbent for the food dye. And we're gonna click on here, or actually you can't enter a number, sorry, you're gonna to have to kind of use this, the scroll over here. and Go to 510, because that's the wavelength we use in lab. So 510 is what you want. And the reason we do that is because it will give us a really good response because the red dye absorbs green. In fact, if you wanna just for funsies, go to red, you can kind of match the color here of the red dye and you can see that if you change it you don't get much of a there's not much response right if you look up here at the transmittance and we change the concentration with this slider here for concentration I'll get to the units in a minute that might confuse you but right now just look if we move this concentration bar it's not changing the transmittance very much because the red light is just transmitting right through it doesn't get absorbed so what we want to do is we want to pick a color like green that has maximum interaction with that molecule and in fact, we're going to go down to 510, and if it changes now, look at that, boom, you get a lot of change there for a concentration difference. So um, what I want to do first is, okay, we've got the color, we've got drink mix selected. Now check this out. You see the path length, remember that? Now check this out. The smaller the path length, right, the less molecules, the less dye this green light goes through, the smaller the, I mean, the more trend light gets through. But if we make this much, much, much wider, there are more red molecules that are absorbing that green light and less of it reaches the detector. And so you can see our percent T goes way down, way down. Okay, so one thing we wanna do is we wanna set this to one centimeter just like we did in lab. So we're gonna grab this little ruler and I want you to grab the ruler and put it over the cuvette. And I want you to set the path length, that is the sample size, to one centimeter. There you go. Make sure you do that. We want to keep things consistent. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some known quantities. And, you're, and I'll write these down in the description, but I want you to use the slider down here. And if you want to get a specific value, you're going to have to use these little toggles down here to get the right value. The first value I want you to measure is 100 millimolar. Now, what does that mean? What does 100 millimolar mean? Well, millimolar is used to measure the concentration for very dilute solutions. And so in this case, one millimolar is basically, I mean, 100 millimolar is what? It's basically 0.1 molar, right? Um, because milli just means a thousand, right? So if you think about it, if you want to get rid of the milli, you divide by a thousand, right? And you get 0.1. If you were to go from 0.1 to millimoles, if you had 0.1 molar, right, molar solution, you just multiply it by 1,000, you get 100. So one molar solution would be 1,000 millimole. Not a big deal, don't worry about it. But just remember, 1,000 is the conversion factor. So I want you to start, and what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you five different concentrations, and I want you to measure, I want you to use the slider now, and actually measure the transmittance up here for each value. So for example, the first one's gonna be 100 millimole. So what you would do is you'd make sure it's at 100 millimole and you see how you have the green light that gets weaker as it goes through because it's being absorbed and what reaches the detector, basically only a third of the light reaches the detector compared to what was initially emitted from the LED. So almost essentially two thirds of the photons are gobbled up and absorbed by the red food dye. Really neat. Okay. The next concentration I want you to try is 885 millimolar. So make sure you wrote down 31.31 because we're going to move on. So we're going to decrease the concentration. 
So if I decrease the concentration, what should happen? Less food dye means less photons absorb, which means more make it through the solution. So our percent T should go up. And it looks like it is. So we're going to stop at 85. 85 is our second value. So I want you to go ahead and write down the transmittance. And at this point, I want you to try three more concentrations. So solution number two will be 65, 65 millimolar. Solution number four will be 40, 40 millimolar. And solution number five will be 25 millimolar, 25. Once you get that data, I want you to throw it into Excel. Go ahead and hit pause and I'll wait for you. Okay, so now I'm gonna bring in my Excel document over here and you'll see what I've got. I've got my millimolars, I've got my solution numbers. Don't, I know your, your lab handout has stock. You can just ignore stock. I'm just gonna call these one through five. One through five. I had 185, 65, 40, 25. Um, I think this guy, the lab, the, the simulation gave you four sig figs. And there you go. So what I want you to do, show me that you can have your percent T. Make sure you enter that into this, this thing because I'm gonna actually ask you to submit your Excel file to show us what you've done. And then I want you to write a formula, right? Like you can see it up here. Remember two minus the log base 10 of the percent T gives you absorbance and you get these values. Now the first plot I'm gonna show you is the one you should generate for percent transmittance versus concentration. Now in this case, I'm gonna use millimolar because it's in my um, units that I had. And so here you can see what you have here. Now remember, this is the exponential function, right? Percent T versus concentration is an exponential. And you can see from my trend line, it is indeed an exponential fit. This is not linear. So I want you to generate a plot that looks like this. But more importantly, I wanna look at this plot here the plot of and I need to relabel this this is going to be absorbance versus concentration now this is really important you change the concentration so that is your independent variable you chose that the dependent variable typically is on the y-axis that is the measurement we took that depends on the concentration and so here you see we have our concentration in our absorbance and this is a linear linear plot right this regression is linear and here you can see you have y equals mx plus b now remember though that this is a millimolar so if you wanted to you could convert this to molar um, by dividing these by a thousand but for right now I'm not so worried about that I want you to be able to see what you have here okay so at this point, you should be able to generate both of these plots on your own. They should be very similar to the pre-lab Excel file that you used, and you're gonna to need to submit this when you submit your lab notebook. The last thing I want to show you um, is that I think your lab notebook will ask you to calculate um, the value for the unknown. And I took the measurement, and let's see what I found. Let me hide it from you real quickly here. I took a measurement for the unknown, the Diet Cherry 7-Up unknown, the beverage, and I found the percent T, the percent transmittance, right, the percent T was 68.3, 68.30, sorry, 68.30. One more time, the percent transmittance, not the absorbance, the percent T was measured to be 68.3. So what I want you to do is use your plot here, right? If you think about it, sorry, here's your plot. I want you to take this plot and I want you to calculate the concentration. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you have this equation here. In this case, Y equals absorbance, X equals concentration. In part A here, we generated, we knew the concentration and we measured the absorbance. So we got this plot. What I'd like you to do now is work backwards. I've given you the percent T. You will convert that to absorbance. That will be your Y. So you'll have to solve this for X. X is the concentration in millimole. 
So once you get that, you'll need to divide by a thousand to convert it to molarity so you can finish the rest of the calculations in the lab. Now granted, since you're in quarantine and your data is not going to fit the class data, you're exempt from calculating the stats in the class data, so don't worry about that. However, I do want you to calculate the millimolar and the molarity of the unknown and use it to complete the calculation for the milligrams of red dye in the serving of the Diet 7-Up. So there's an example of that calculation. I hope I've done a good job of walking you through this and giving you a little bit more background so you can complete the lab. If you have any questions, make sure to reach out to your lab instructor and I'm sure they would be very, very happy to help you finish the lab or if you have questions on whatever calculations you're stuck on. Remember, you need to complete your lab notebook. Your, your procedure is going to be a little bit different, so write a real quick summary of what you did for the simulation and then finish your uh, results and your calculations and write a short conclusion. If you do all that, you should be all cut up for this week's lab. So hang in there. Take care of yourself. I know it stinks being in quarantine. I hope you're not ill. And make sure if you're having trouble to reach out. We want to help you. We want to support you. Talk to your instructor and we'll do whatever we can, whether it be a due date extension or help or questions to be answered. Just reach out. We want to support you. We miss you guys and we want to do the best we can to help you get through this. So take care of yourselves. Um, watch out um, for your mental health. Make sure you're, you know, you're talking to people, you're talking to family, you're talking to the counselors if you need help. And we're here to support you however we can. So take care. Goodbye.